people. You know, not, not that many people, only a few, six. So I, I'm gonna join the, the clay class. He put me in the clay class. So I'm, I guess I'm gonna be now, uh, an, uh, let's see, an, a sculptor. A so, potter. Yeah. You're gonna be a no, potter. I, but I don't wanna make pot a child. Good morning, how are you? Good. And you will then, be like Harry Potter. I want to make a statue like, like Venus. Okay. Well, you can. Okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you got to learn how to play with clay first. Uh -huh. so, so you're so you're going to make a few pinch props before you get around to Venus. So. I don't want to make ashtray. I'm not having you make an ashtray. I'm having you. Okay. I'm having you make a pinch pot. There's a pinch big pot. Yes, a pinch pot. Mm -hmm. See, you got to learn how to do that first before you can do the other. And, and a pinch pot is a what now? Oh, it's Miss Bernice. Good morning. A pinch <laughs> pot? Oh. Mm -hmm. A pinch pot is like the oldest method of working with clay. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, you know, it goes back close to 30,000 years. Um, when, when people first discovered that they could start, you know, making things out of clay and, you know, if they, if they made something or a piece of clay got into the fire, by the time that the fire burned down, the coals, you know, burned out, it became hard, you know, mm -hmm. it got what we call vitrified, right? No. So they started making like small pots and containers and vessels. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to use, you know, for all kinds of things out of clay because it was a readily available material. But uh, simply a pinch pot is if you take clay and you roll it into a ball and you take your thumb and you stick in the center of that ball and then you start squeezing and then turning and squeezing and turning and work all the way around, you can create a void in the center of that or make what we call a vessel or a pot, you know, now, a pot. Outside my, uh, here, outside my apartment, mm -hmm. is uh, that uh, red clay all over this property. Is that, this, that clay can be used for pottery or need to be treated? Well, all clay has to be, basically, you've got to take it, you got to clean it, you know, and then, uh, yeah. And different clays fire at different temperatures, right? Mm -hmm. That red clay that you're talking about, um, mm -hmm. if it's in Georgia, then generally what we have in Georgia is a clay called Lysella, right? And it mm -hmm. comes in that red color. It also comes in like a yellow, yeah. or white, or even black. Mm -hmm. so it comes in a variety of colors. Um, but Lysella fires at, uh, you know, generally a, a low fire temperature, okay? So, mm -hmm. but yeah, you could use it. You just have to filter it, clean it, and, you know, get all of the <laughs> organic material out of it <laughs> before you can use it. Anyway, but uh, how's everybody doing? Okay. Well, hey, hey. here. Monday morning. Oh, sorry, John. What? Monday morning. So doing it. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, Naomi's here twice, so we've really only got ten. Okay. Well, guess what we're going to talk about today? Um. Russia. Russia? No, we're not going to talk about Russia. All right. <laughs> please. No. No. Yeah. Please. No. 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 Yeah. Yeah, we're going to talk about, yes, we're going to talk about art. We're going to talk about art from a particular area of the world, commonly known as Africa, okay? Uh -huh. And, um, you know, some of you may have a great interest in African art. Some may not. You know, some may kind of look at it and go, you know, eh, I don't like that, you know. But keep an open mind, okay? Uh, and I'm going to start off, we've got uh, actually four videos, one of them is a fairly long involved video, and it gives a lot of information about, you know, history, um, you know, of Africa and African art and 
you know, how it's used. So I want you to, you know, just take a listen, okay? And then we'll get into looking at uh, not so much traditional African art, but really what's going on in Africa now as far as what, what are people from that continent actually making? And one of the things I think you'll be surprised about is really the great diversity of people, uh, you know, from that continent now, okay? Because, you know, there's not just black Africans. There's also, you know, Arab Africans in the Northern part. There's a lot of white Africans. There's uh, a large Hindu population there. Uh, mm -hmm. There's also a fairly large and growing Asian population in uh, Africa as well, different parts. So, uh, you know, it should be an interesting ride. Hopefully you have a cup of coffee. And, you know, we're going to be talking about a lot of different things, you know, as we move along through this today. Uh, but we're going to do the history part first. Okay. And it's kind of long. It's about 47 minutes. Okay. So get yourself a cup of coffee and you might want a notepad. Uh, you might want to write, you know, some of this down. Uh, if you have questions or anything like that, I'll... I'll try to answer them, you know, at the end of the video. Okay. Sound okay. fair? Yes. All right. Away we go. Let's see. Yes. That's the one. <laughs> and there we go. Let's see. Let's reduce that. screen. Off we go. For centuries, Africa has occupied a vivid place in the Western imagination. Its sheer size, diversity and the wildness of its landscapes have made it the object of fantasy. The result has been an image of Africa that has often been less concerned with what Africa really is than what others want it to be. The same has certainly been true of perceptions of Africa's art. You can't look at African art just in Europe. Uh, African art was made in Africa. It has a deep complicated meaning, it has a history, it has a context that's integral to it itself. We're never able to fully look at anything on its own terms because all of our acts of understanding are acts of interpretation. I think that all of us have had to learn new ways of appreciating beauty, new ways of seeing beauty. This film is an attempt to journey beyond our preconceptions and look at the art of Africa through the eyes of Africans. This is Wulanjan Bugu, a village of the Bamana people in Mali, northwest Africa. The entire region is especially rich in traditional art forms. <laughs> These carvers are working on what is known here as a chihuahua, a kind of antelope or ibex, whose image has been carved by the Bamana people for hundreds of years. To the western eye, the piece looks like a sculpture. In fact, it's a headdress designed to be part of a ceremony consisting of a costume, music and dance. The 
Tuwara is a mythical creature, which according to legend taught the Bamana, or a farming community, to till the soil. Our forefathers, this village, were farmers. Farming is the only thing we know how to do, and the Tuwara represents the two pronged plough. When the rainy season starts, we call for the Chihuahua. It follows us to the fields and gives us the strength to cultivate the land. The Chihuahua gives the young men the power to plow the fields quickly. Chihuahua. There's a large oral tradition surrounding the Chihuahua, which the Bamana take for granted as part of the fabric of their culture and history. What for them is something which has a defined social function, we might regard simply as a work of art. In the West, we take works from Africa and display them in art galleries and museums. Here yeah, they're carefully lit and scrutinized as art. But however beautifully displayed, they're far removed from the cultures that produced them. When you see the mask without the rest of the costume and things in the museum for the first time, that is rather peculiar. Coming from Nigeria, I'm looking at it from a different perspective. I'm not seeing these objects in museums as art objects. It's very, very important that you know the context that it should be in. People that don't care about the context of African art are losing an awful lot. There's an artist, um, my people are very important to me. I was very much attracted to these Gelidin masks because they had wonderful passive faces <laughs> and absolute chaos on their heads. And as a child, um, I, I had seen Yoruba open group dances and I knew that these dancers had wonderful costumes. Supposedly these are masqueraders come out to sort of appease the gods and to talk to the town about what was good or bad about um, the politics and the social situation and um, this thing had to be appeased and had to do a dance and had supposedly secret charms and things in its pockets. This is theatre and very very exciting um, and it's what I consider African art to be. The problem is that a lot of these objects have many different functions in Africa. Um, some of them are worn, some of them are used as currency. They all have a function. And um, putting them um, in, in a gallery, they lose all of that um, and become art objects, yes, in Western eyes. But from an African's point of view, they become useless. Nevertheless, many African artists have for years collected and used African art to provide ideas and inspiration. They've found meanings of their own objects from Africa. I don't collect to have a collection. You know, I'm not a collector in this sense that I like to have peace. You know? They are part of me and part of my world. Because for me, it's what I call the thinking time. My eye takes me. My eye does the thinking for me. They mean to me what visually they mean. Not what 
antropologik. Mm. Mm. What European artists found so attractive in Africa now is precisely this freedom that they could put breasts where anatomically they don't belong. And at the same time, by the oversight of it, gave a new power to the whole thing. And this is what European artists are to learn. We learn from them that you need to be correct as the 19th century wanted us to be, as the Greco-Roman tradition wanted us to be. You need. You can do with a piece of the body whatever you want. You can treat it wherever you want. And at the same time, keep it real. Nobody could mistake this for anything but the good. It was at the Paris World Exhibition of 1900 that Western artists and the population in general initially encountered art from Africa. This was the first large-scale exhibition of African art in Europe. But this was the colonial era, and the objects were the booty of conquest. Interesting curios of distant people, but not art. In the event, though, objects like these were to inspire Paris's artistic community in a way that no one foresaw. One of the artists who came into contact with African art early on was Pablo Picasso. His relationship with art from Africa not only acted as a catalyst for the development of Cubism, but changed the whole course of art in the 20th century. The story begins with what is now regarded as Picasso's seminal painting. The Demoiselle d'Avignon. In the spring of 1907, Picasso was working on a major picture of female nudes. It was going to be a tremendous, powerful statement. He wanted it to be aggressive. It was perhaps one of the most studied pictures he ever made. Picasso had begun to devise ways of simplifying the body. And in early summer, of ethnography of the trophy. Uh, there, uh, no. And that felt, I was like, I'm glad, I don't know if your son was home because nobody came to the door, yeah. but thank, I guess uh, that was what he did. Hello, everybody. Could we, uh, could we yes. mute yourselves? Okay, we got a lot of background stuff going on. So if you can put the mute on, please, so that we're not hearing what's happening back there. Okay, thank you. Returning from this experience with a new courage to defy the conventions of representation, he repeated many of the figures in the picture. This hit seems to have a kind of scarification pattern and the so-called pie wedge or wedge of cheese nose, which seems to relate directly to African masks. And then the strangest and most deformed head on the seated prostitute in the lower right has a twisted nose, scarification patterns, disruption, and a flattened radical quality, which again suggests an African mask. It gave him a new way to see, first of all. And secondly, it gave him a way to break away from his own European antecedents, the, the late 19th century tra tradition of painting. You look at the drawings of Le Damazelle before he visited the Trocadero, and then after he visited the Trocadero, you realize that modernism and primitivism are flip sides of the same coin. That the face of modernism in Europe is a black face that buried within all this high modernism is the presence of the African. In the decades that followed, the direction of European art was radically changed. Shapes became non-naturalistic. 
stylized, aggressive, and exaggerated. Abstraction <clears throat> began to develop. There was a new power to the forms, which was emotional rather than intellectual. Picasso, who finally admitted in 1942 that African art had been a pivotal influence upon him, describes it in terms that are so similar to the way that Freud describes the encounter with the uncanny. Everybody talks about the influences that the Negroes had on me. What can I do? We all of us love fetishes. Van Gogh once said, Japanese art, we all have that in common. For us, it's the Negroes. When I went to the old Trocadero, it was disgusting. Smell. I was alone. I wanted to get away, but I didn't leave. I stayed. I stayed. I understood that it was very important. Something was happening to me. The masks weren't just like any other pieces of sculpture. Not at all. They were magic things. African art was regarded as something that was produced outside of training outside of academic discipline, something that didn't obey the rules they had been taught. It didn't seem to have the smothering blanket of a civilized tradition on top of it. Instead, it seemed to be an upsurge of natural emotion and a more immediate seizing of the world. And so they found that it was more true and more direct to the wellsprings of basic creativity. The power of the primitive was an echo of the popular and less benign image of Africa as a place of savagery and barbarism, a continent in need of control. It was an image of primitivism shamelessly promoted with missionary zeal and often with ludicrous success by the colonial powers who sought to justify their own claim to be civilizing Africa. For different reasons, artists too embraced the idea of the dark continent. Africa was perceived, as best we can judge, by early modern artists in terms of a set of cliches which might center on the term darkness and the dark continent. They saw the idea of mystery, of magic, of savagery as being located in an area of Africa beyond traditional civilized contact and this sense led them to believe that by exploring African art and by touching into what African art could bring them, they would also get back to something deeper and purer in their own spirits. These were the fanciful ideas that underpinned early Western interpretations of African art. Objects which in their own culture were associated with healing and positive powers in Europe were called fetishes, a word which has become laden with disturbing connotations and which tells us more about the Western psyche regarding Africa than Africa itself. The true purpose of such objects didn't concern the modernists. Picasso was even quoted as saying, all I need to know about Africa is in that mask. They were acknowledging the degree to which there was a vitality and a vibrancy in African culture that they did not find in their own culture. But like any set of human beings, they bring with them their own baggage, their own set of presuppositions and prejudgments and prejudices. And the disservice that they did, of course, was to cast off African culture, African art works, and art objects as exotic, primitive, even barbaric. Today, African art is being reinterpreted. Partly what's under scrutiny is the modernist influence on the way African art is regarded. But what's also being reappraised is how the art is looked at in the light of Africa's recent troubled history. African art cannot be divorced from the fact that it's made by black people. It's made by people with a fraught history. It's been exhibited in museums and the wealthiest cities in the world. Um, it comes from some of the poorest nations in the world today. Um, none of that is very far beneath the surface. 
it's intimately tied up with the history of colonialism, racism, slavery, the whole nine yards, a very complicated history. And no one looks at a piece of African art with that history completely submerged. A crucial turning point came in 1985, not in Africa, but in America. The catalyst was an exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, which set out to show how the art of the 20th century had been influenced by so-called primitive works. In the delicate racial climate of the USA, the exhibition provoked a roar of protest by its implicit assumption of the superiority of Western art. It was a show about the West positioning itself um, to interpret another culture and not interpret it appropriately, I think more than anything else, and deciding which point of view was more important at that time. And that show really um, just seemed to have been the critical point, the critical juncture at which, at which, of which our, our attitudes, our misconceptions, our ways of presenting African art or representing African art, it seemed to have been the critical point for this course. It has to do in part with a level of sensitivity. It has to do with understanding that these objects cannot just purely be de decontextualized, that um, we have been doing that historically for a long time in the West. demands that African art should be seen in its own context and not in inferior relation to Western art tradition have been particularly strident among African-American academics. Today, the emphasis has shifted from a purely aesthetic appreciation of the art to one which takes into account an object's purpose and meaning. There are times when the artwork just exists purely as a way of seeing, as a way of embodying form as an expression, and it's not important primarily to know who did it even, where it was done, when it was done, or why it was done. There are other times when that's enormously important, if one's establishing the depth of the tradition, the relationship of one tradition to another tradition, or the corpus of an individual artist, or if one is, is considering larger philosophical questions, questions of belief systems, questions of comparative metaphysics, questions of comparative aesthetics, Context then is of absolute importance. In some ways, it's very similar to uh, attempts to understand uh, art during the Renaissance in Italy. They had their own context. They had to understand the history. They had to understand the culture. They had to understand the society. We had to engage in a lot of historical work to be able to reconstruct the very ways in which these art objects are produced, produced for what? For whom, under what circumstances, what are their roles and functions in regard to ritual, in regard to ceremony? All these are historical and anthropological questions. And they must be part of our complex response to art as a movement. Think about looking at a painting of a Madonna and child. If you don't realize who that lady is with the baby, you haven't you haven't begun to grasp what the artist is trying to do, and you have missed part of the pleasure. Part of the very pleasure of the thing comes from knowing who that is, what it means, what the artist, what it meant to the artist, even if it doesn't mean anything to you. The Madonna and Child is one of an infinite number of cultural references and symbols we take for granted. How possible is it to step into another culture and to discover and understand the meanings within their works of art? In other words, to see in their objects what Africans see. Here in Mali, for example, the first thing you discover is that one of the largest of many indigenous cultures, the Bamana, don't even have a word for art. <laughs> correspond to the word art, as we can see in its acceptance. The statues of the temple, the statues, for example, are called in Romania Dirimani, which means simply the characters in wood. So we can add that they are beautiful, that is, Uchekain, but 
dire qu'il y a un mot qui correspond à art au sens occidental du terme, je ne crois pas compte. In this village, the production of traditional art, mostly masks and sculptures, has evolved out of a rigid order. It's made by members of a certain caste to a prescribed design. We followed. We became carvers because our father was a carver. We started when we were very young. It's what we do for a living. As children, we used to go into the workshop. We watched them at work and practiced with small pieces of wood until we got it right. If a person wanted to carve in their own particular style, there would be nothing to stop them. But this type of carving forms part of our heritage and should be maintained. Il y a toute une série de symbolisme, signes qui doivent être respectés dans la fabrication. Donc ils n'ont pas cette liberté de l'artiste, cette liberté absolue de l'artiste, comme on peut parler de l'image. Je ne crois pas qu'on puisse parler effectivement de création d'art. In a way, we, we home in very much on the idea of the artist as an individual and a creator. Um, and in some sense, that has to be seen against the backdrop of an industrial society where most things are made by machine. Uh, we look upon that as, as almost the immortal aspect of the artist. That's not necessarily the case elsewhere. Uh, I once worked with a lot of Cameroonian potters uh, who were very keen that their objects, their, their pots, should be of known types. If you made a new sort of pot, I mean, this wasn't innovation, you just got it wrong. Yet these same women uh, decorated their, their millet farms with all sorts of beautiful patterns and everyone was different, everyone was new and excited, all this. And so, I mean, to me, that was art. So I went and I asked them about these patterns on their right, and they, they, they just laughed at me. No, 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 they said, no, that's just play, that's not important. Um, if it were important, everyone would do it the same. The Romana artist's purpose is to continue a tradition, not to strive for originality in order to secure his work a place in history. However beautiful, objects are made to serve a function. So if the Bamana don't recognize the term art, I'll be right to keep calling it that. I think not calling it art is to denigrate it, is to ignore the fact that enormous aesthetic competence and artistic skill and invention went into the creation of these objects. I think it's to divorce it from what we call the history of art, what we call the sort of mainstream of human creativity. I think it's to wrong it deeply. We're fairly muddled about what we mean by art, even in the West. It's no longer a well-defined category. It seems that a pile of bricks or a dead sheep can be art. It's a way of looking at things. So the, the question about African art, I suppose, is really whether it's helpful to look at African objects from the point of view of Western art. I don't think it tells us a lot about what those objects meant. Uh, in their original context, how they were used, the social processes they entered into, how they were seen and how they were interpreted. Um, I mean, in a sense, design is a much closer European concept to, to, to apply to traditional African art because there's always that tension to conform to the truth. At one point, these objects were considered curio. At another point, they were considered the stimulus for the modernists. At another point, they were uh, artifacts that were displayed within um, natural history museums, and now they are art. But again, it's who has been doing all of this talking, whose perspective are we um, focused on? It is speaking from the West, looking at a history of engagement with a culture that has been essentially, from our perspective, our position of strength, and from our um, desire to define others, within the context of our own experience. And we can't, I don't think we can get away from that.
This is Dogon country. Nowhere are the pitfalls of defining another culture from within the frames of reference of one's own more evident than here. One of the most famous of Africa's cultures it has attracted an avalanche of anthropological research. But far from illuminating the art of the Dogon, it's actually helped obscure it. Dogon sculptures are rooted in a complex cosmological belief system, one of the oldest in Africa. Used in their original context, they represent ancestors and divinities through whom the Dogon worship Ama, the creator of life and the ultimate force in the universe. This rural community can provide no historical records or written scholarship to help us to understand Dogon art. Today we rely on work carried out by Western anthropologists. Their long-standing claim of a highly elaborate mythic structure underpins all aspects of Dogon life is what has drawn outside interest to the Dogon. But this theory is not one that's now accepted in Mali. La recherche de la culture de Dogon sur les Dogon a été menée à l'époque coloniale et en général par effectivement une recherche africaniste dont toute la première période est liée à l'ethnologie coloniale. Cette ethnologie coloniale effectivement voyait l'Afrique comme une Afrique mythique. Et je crois qu'aujourd'hui c'est cette image qui est passée par exemple, en, qui est passée essentiellement en Europe. This is a ceremony to ask for rain. When you look at one culture through the eyes of another, particularly it seems with Africa, there's an irresistible tendency to impose your own perceptions. But this ritual is doubtless no more mysterious to the Dogon than singing hymns or taking communities to us. It's thought that early Dogon contacts told scholars what they thought they wanted to hear, and so layers of meaning were projected onto objects which were never actually intended. Il est évident que aujourd'hui, cela prend premier un petit peu la connaissance que nous avons sur sur la culture parce que ces chercheurs-là, obsédés par leur vision éthique de la culture, n'ont pas perçu la culture en tant que production quotidienne. In the study of art, in especially art objects that move from one culture to another, there are always two grave dangers. One is sort of gross exoticism where you say, well, people over there are so different from us that they have nothing in common with us and their objects have to be treated as if they came from Mars. The other is pure ethnocentrism. I'm saying, you know, well, I've seen what these chaps do doing their ritual. To me, it looks like the Charleston, therefore I've understood it. We are now kind of going through a phase of re-examining even how the field work was done in Africa and whether those who went to the continent brought with them all kinds of Western baggage that were placed on the African, and whether the language differences and how those barriers were breached, and, and whether what was shared from the African side with the scholars and visited and, and the anthropologists that went to Africa was interpreted correctly, was understood correctly, was translated correctly, and it was brought back and presented appropriately. The tourist industry in the Dogon reflects just how difficult it is to interpret definitively another culture. 
Today, the Dugong people tailor their mask dances according to different cultural tastes. They use one set of masks for Westerners and another for themselves. It's early morning and the dancers are rehearsing. There are no tourists as it's the rainy season. First, they perform wearing the older, more traditional masks. These are the ones they'll use for Western audiences. Historically, the mask dances, or dammers as they're called, are performed at funerals and other religious occasions. As in pantomime or masquerade, the faces represent familiar characters. This is womankind, otherwise barred from belonging to the dance society or taking part. Another of several interpretations is that she represents the elder sister of the masks. The Kanaga mask is most often associated with dog on dances. This one is a stork. Whatever the original symbolism might have been has been lost. There's a strong comic element to the masks. This one depicts a woman of the Fulani people. They're tall and pale skinned. The white cowrie shells are meant to represent her light complexion. The hair is in classic Fulani style. But the images are left over from another age, when the Fulani were mocked and disliked because they were rulers in the region. Many of these characters no longer have much meaning within contemporary Dogon society. The culture of Dogon is soumise to the people. Today, for example, the country of Dogon, the Dogon are ready à refaire des manifestations qui sont essentiellement rituelles pour les gens. Ce n'est pas forcément une mauvaise chose. Mais ce qui est vrai, c'est que le tourisme a contribué à faire so à sauvegarder simplement une, des aspects de la culture qui n'intéressent que, que le tourisme. Et ça, je veux dire qu'il y a une sorte de, 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 de sélection hein, de la culture euh, touristique. Ouais. Ouais. Masks that tourists don't get to see. They don't appeal to Western tastes, and the dog on dancers know that. They're made and used for local dances only. They're less elaborate than the old masks, and more brightly painted and garish. They're altogether more obviously comic. More to the point, they also present the viewer with a new gallery of characters. This is the goiter, a fairly common affliction in the dog on. Here's the mask of a traditional healer. And this is a face that will doubtless be of more in the future, the white man. This is a local Dutch anthropologist and shows how contemporary material is constantly being incorporated into dog on mask art. obsession. <laughs> ancien, hein, que, comme on le, on, on le pense en Europe. Pour les Européens, plus un objet d'art est ancien, plus il, est, il prend de la valeur. Alors que euh, nous, nos statuettes, par exemple, et nos masques euh, sont essentiellement des objets euh, religieux, des objets rituels. Et ils ont, euh, au cours de leur vie active, ils servent au hein, rite, ils ont euh, une durée de vie limitée. Euh, par exemple, fabriquer un masque pour une cérémonie rituelle et après cette cérémonie rituelle, euh, ne plus s'en servir. C'est-à-dire que ça vie se termine. The short life of art objects here is partly due to the fact that the rituals and dances they're used for are continually evolving. Artists in Africa today, tomorrow, next week, are making objects that are going to be used in ways that they have been used in the past and in new ways. They're constantly inventing new forms and changing the received forms, adding to them, subtracting, updating them. They've always done that.
On the other side of the Niger River, there's another obstacle in the attempt to see the art of this African country through the eyes of its people, a journey already fraught with unexpected difficulties. What happens when the context is lost or completely unknown? ancient city of Jeno. Much of its history has been lost. What we do know is that it was founded before the birth of Christ and flourished between the 8th and the 17th centuries through trans-Saharan trade. From the 15th century, the city came under control of the Songhai Empire. The conquerors came from the north and brought with them Islam. Jeno became and still is an established centre of Islamic learning. The route also brought wealth. Everywhere there are signs of artistry and patronage, which have made the entire city of Jena the United Nations designated world monument. Outside Jena are the ancient settlements that predate the coming of Islam. Virtually no archaeological excavation has been done and little is known about how the people lived or the art they created, although there's evidence of sophisticated civilization everywhere. In the 1970s, a number of terracotta figures were found on the site. They're believed to have been made by a lost wax process, which is no longer used in the region. The meaning of the strange pasture-like markings on the bodies of many is a mystery. As is the significance of what appear to be snakes adorning the torso. We may never know the story behind works of art found here or their function in the society from which they came. This part was left behind by raiders who had taken the best and discarded what won't command the highest price. Today the sites are constantly plundered for the international art market. It's ironic that the wish by some people to own a Jena terracotta is the very reason they'll probably never understand its significance or what it meant to the people who once lived in this part of Mali. The problem with trying to define the context of art is that what you see is never to be subjective. That can be confused, elusive, and in the case of ancient Jena, possibly lost forever. There are simply too many variables. The ultimate aim in trying to understand another culture's art 
is to see in the objects what the people who made them once saw. But that's a fantasy. Chaque culture a produit ses œuvres d'art. Je crois que les gens ont une vision de leur œuvre d'art qui ne peut pas être la même que celle effectivement ceux qui la regardent de l'extérieur. Even if we could shed our own cultural conditioning, the search for the correct context of art objects would still be a fruitless, endless journey. We won't find the definitive answer. What we can learn on the way is that there are values, aesthetic disciplines, and forms of beauty which are quite distinct from our own. And it's that understanding that has to be the key to looking at art from other countries. In the end, though, the search for the meaning of African art is a journey that will always take us back to our own culture. There's no escaping the fact that Africa and African art have been a touchstone in the lightning rod for lots of Western feelings and political ambitions and fears and other emotions, powerful emotions for a long, long time. And African art becomes almost a pawn in a larger debate. Um, African art in the West becomes the subject around which we debate a lot of issues that have very little to do with Africa today, but have a lot to do with our own conflicts and our own past and our own desires to represent. I think that the debate about African art today is about Europe itself. And I think that it uncannily mirrors Picasso's encounter with African art in the old truck era. You see, Picasso that day didn't discover Africa. Picasso discovered himself. Picasso discovered Europe. Picasso discovered a new way of representing European sensibility through the prism of African art. Likewise, the debate today is about how Europeans are imagining themselves or representing themselves through the mirror or prism of the other. <laughs> So, anybody got any thoughts about that? Well, I love, I love that they brought up about the fact that there is a story behind all the artwork. It's just, it's more of, of a community uh, co collaboration, not just an individual who's doing things, but a community. And it's what the artwork is, was for, just not just to someone to glory over, but to glorify the ancestors and what life was really about and what it meant really meant to them. One little thing that caught my attention that was I thought was so cute was the, the little toddler, the young man who was running through the corridor uh, and he was uh, playing with a wheel, it's like a child's first toy. Like he was just going there with pulls and pushing that little wheel like you find that and he's just going around the community having a good day in his child way uh, and enjoying his environment. <laughs> now wheel just kind of like said it all. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, was, it was really about nothing but then it was about a whole lot. Yeah. So, and I've seen a lot of the, uh, this artwork. I remember one time I lived in, well I was in Chicago, 
at the Art Institute and I met these two gentlemen that were from Africa and they had come to the Chicago to sell some of the art they had bought mm -hmm. from Africa. And so they asked my friend and I, did we want to see it? So they were staying at the Convent Hilton across the street. So we went up to their room and they had, uh, they had this suite that was just full of African art, just full of African art that they had bought to uh, share with uh, the museum. And, and then at that time, I had not been really introduced to hands on uh, a lot of African art. And I was there at, at the museum because in my, my college class, you had to do art appreciation. So you had to go to see art of all forms and all from all countries and everything. So that was a, really a wonderful thing for me to see. And I'm glad that somebody did this uh, video. Thank you for sharing, Charles. Well, one of the things that this video brought up were a couple of really major issues in the art world right now. You know, one, one is the, what we now refer to as cultural appropriation. Okay. And it's, it's where we take, well, for example, African math, right? And then we appropriate that look, you know, those symbols, things like that. You know, and when I say we, Western culture appropriates them, you know, um, and they're out of context. You know, we don't really understand, you know, the real true meaning of a lot of this stuff. And yet we're using it, uh, or artists are using it in the West, you know, in creating their own art. Now, you know, there's some debate out there as to whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. And I think you can argue it both ways. Um, you know, a, as a visual artist myself, it would be difficult for me to spend time looking at something from another culture and not appropriate it and use it to my own devices, right? Because once I see it, it sort of becomes part of me. And so I, I use it to interpret, you know, my own work um, or to create my own work in, in many ways. So, you know, we, we, you know, we could have a long discussion about things like that. Um, and it's not just from other cultures, you know, it's also from, you know, other influences, other artists. So, you know, there's that aspect of it. There's also the aspect of that this video brought up of, you know, Africa right now is in a state of post what they call post-colonialism. And, you know, what happened there historically was that a lot of the culture um, was basically, you know, some people call it, you know, appropriated, other people call it stolen, you know, and hauled off to museums all over the world, you know, particularly in Europe. And so now there's, you know, a large debate about repatriating, you know, a lot of those art forms and things back to the cultures that they came from. So, you know, it's, there's, there's a lot of different issues uh, that, you know, we could talk about around that. And uh, in fact, some of the videos that we'll watch coming up, you know, which are more of a context of not, not historically what art was in Africa, but what it's becoming. And, you know, and basically from the viewpoint of artists who one, grew up in those cultures. So. What, one, thing, one thing I did want, want to say, child, that mm -hmm. kind of saddened me is uh, that they talk about the rituals that you think you're seeing, mm -hmm. uh, really rituals that are really what's what's uh what the european culture may want to see 
And what's happening with that is that the native people there, uh, because they do so much of, uh, cause so much is so sold through that, that they're actually losing their own culture because they're trying to, they're trying to uh, uh, make sure that uh, what they show can be sold. So, you know, so, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was interesting to me that uh, what, we misunderstand and what we don't know about, we kind of demonize it over time. We compare it with a culture that we're familiar with and we don't accept the fact that art is an expression. And it, as they mentioned in the film, um, it's based on history, religion, uh, heritage, a lot of different other things. And we uh, see if it doesn't match up with what we have been commonly trained or learn what is good and what is bad, then we, we uh, label it as uh, negative mm -hmm. or something evil. But that I think that comes from not only the African cultures, but from other cultures too, that uh, if it's not, if it doesn't match ours, then something must be wrong with it. Right. So it's uh, kind of sad with that. And uh, then now what uh, um, Bernice was saying, it's an economic thing now. So we lose a lot of the history, uh, the meanings of things because we need to make money to make an income, to make a living to live. And also we compare with what we, we compare what we don't know with what we do know and then try to merge it together and it doesn't always uh, match up like that. It was also interesting to me that um, when they were mentioning the fact that Picasso picked up a lot of his uh, themes from uh, African art and Cubism and uh, created Cubism that that style of art uh, originated from another culture blended into the European culture and perhaps it was the foundations of what we know now today as abstract art. So there are a lot of things that uh, were interesting in that to, to, movie. To elaborate, uh, El Eloise, uh, mm -hmm. to, to elaborate on Eloise's point, it, it was it was like, uh, okay, uh, this is primitive art, but, 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 but when it got it, uh, appropriated, now all of a sudden it's, it's the background for modern art, you know, it was primitive when it was in its net, you know, when it was there, but now it's the, it's the base, it's, it's the basis for modern art, you know. My thought is if you hadn't appropriated some of the art, you would not have seen it. And they destroy it after their, their one use of it because it is a, a religious part, but but you you would never see the beauty in it because it would have been destroyed. So you have to say why, 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 why do you think it would have been destroyed? Because they say they use it one time and one time only. Then you wouldn't save a thousand pieces. You pitch it out. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't believe they said any of the old things that once it you was used for a celebration. Now, now, you, now, you, now, you, now you know you're talking about one culture, and there are a lot of cultures in there. Mm -hmm. Yes, but just just the thought of just one person yeah, that's, that's doing that, or one culture, one area, but mm -hmm. you wouldn't have seen it. You wouldn't have been able to enjoy it. You the beauty of it. Uh, I mean, you don't have to criticize it. You just enjoy the beauty of it, and it would have been destroyed. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. Let me let me step in here, okay? Because before we go off <laughs> sideways. Um, yes, you know, a lot of these objects, you know, they were taken out of context, you know, and when Europeans saw these things, you know, they interpreted it in their own context. And uh, let's talk about that, that idea of primitive art, okay? You know, when you when you look historically okay a lot of these african cultures and a lot of this art is derived from a culture that literally goes back you know four five thousand years okay and you know we're beginning you know and in in this in the 21st century finally 
to acknowledge the fact that these were highly evolved art forms. You know, we call it art. Um, you know, it was parts of their culture that have evolved over a very long period of time. And one of the things I think that was valuable in this particular uh, film presentation was the discussion about the fact that, okay, there are people, you know, who it's like a family business that's it's passed down, right? Their function in their society is to carve, right? And they have to do it in a particular way. You know, there are boundaries in which they, you know, they create these things. Um, and so their culture is very different, you know, in the sense of if you look at an artisan or an artist in Western culture, we have different, you know, there's, there's different boundaries. You know, in the West, you know, we're supposed to, as artists, interpret things in, in our own way, try to make something new, make something different, right? In their culture, they don't want them to go outside those boundaries because they're trying to maintain a particular lineage, you know, within that culture. And so those art forms are highly designed and already there's sort of a standard that they need to meet, you know, to, you know, to fit into that culture. So, so it's a different conversation, you know, than, than it would be if they were in fact, you know, in our culture. So everybody kind of get that and understand the difference. Would it think to people will always interpret everything and everybody is different and it'll always be that way, but you could still enjoy the beauty of it if they will allow you to see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I'm I'm not against, you know, I'm not against museums and things having you know, archaeological or anthropological exhibits of things from past cultures or even current cultures. In fact, you know, one of one of the things that could greatly improve Western society, I think, you know, when we're talking about Western society, European and American, you know, in particular, uh, North American, um, is to collect, you know, current art and artifacts and objects from different cultures, you know, and actually have them on display here. But as they're doing that, make sure that you give it a, an accurate context as to how it's seen in that culture, how it's used, what the importance of it is, why, it, you know, why is it important? You know, why would they make, you know, the things that they make? Um, and you see, that's the thing that we lacked in the past, you know, and, uh, and I think there's a lot of effort going on currently to, to view things and to, to bring a certain level of accuracy, um, with what those objects are and what the true meaning of them are. And I think that's really important. So. You know, it's what's, what's happening in our society that is a shame is that I remember going over to, to uh, I was in Europe, and I was getting ready to leave Glasgow, and they had this little shop and everything. And I wanted to bring something back that was from, from Glasgow, from Scotland, so that I could have that part of my memory bank and part of my, but everything I picked up was made in China or someplace else. So these, so it's being lost in that particular kind of way, and so I, I yeah. so I can appreciate uh, something being handmade, you know, uh, not just made by machine. I, I think the glory of making it by machine is the person who created and developed that machine. I'm just fascinated how machines work, whatever they produce. But I, I love what yeah. people do with their own hands. But God has given them also. So you don't give weight just to the machine to mass produce it for, mm -hmm. you know, 
<laughs> Some things should be more sacred than that. Okay. And, and you know, you just, what you had experienced there is what is called cultural appropriation. Yes. Mm -hmm. See? Mm -hmm. and, it's yeah. happening, and it's happening all over the world, you know. Um, you know, if you go to Asia, there's a lot of stuff, you know, in these, in these shops and things that are not, you know, that most people in China or Japan wouldn't even have in their house. Mm -hmm. You know, to them, it's, you know, it's something that's for tourists, period. You know, it goes back, it goes back to the chop suey. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's like, you know, Westerners have a certain ideal, you know, of what their culture is, is like. It, it's not what it really is. But there are, you know, there are people who, you know, make a business out of you know, feeding, you know, that viewpoint. And, uh, you know, and it's there and you have to realize that it's there. And, and it's not, yeah, it's not just in African culture. It also mm -hmm. happens in European culture all over the place. You know, go to, go to any major European city and try to find anything that's really authentic from any of those cultures. And if you look at the bottom of most of it, it will have made in China or Taiwan or somewhere, yep. you know, on it. <laughs> the wonderful world of capitalism. Exactly. Yeah. 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 That's that's but, pretty much but, hitting the nail on the head. When I when it, it I takes can't... away the joy of, of, of going on vacation because you're not going to bring anything back. I very seldom bring anything back because I can buy what I get back home. So, right. What? <laughs> you have yeah. to go to a special artisan's. Uh, art uh, <coughs> and buy from them because it will be theirs and right. not a duplicated thing. Of course, it's be quite an expensive souvenir, but at least it would be uh, something uh, authentic, right? Authentic. Yeah. yeah. And and when I came to the United States, uh, my family took me to Indian reservation. And when I went, I saw something that I saw was made by India. When I looked, said, made in Taiwan. I said, oh, oh. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I hate to tell you this, you know, but uh, you know, that that was going to be one of the examples that I brought up, you know, because I mean, you know, in the United States itself, within the continental United States, you know, we we have wonderful examples of where cultures have literally. <laughs> been mythologized, you know, and the culture was nothing like what that myth is. Um, you know, and if, if, you, if you look at those groups of people within the confines of the continental United States now, we call them Native Americans, um, you know, the same thing is going on. You know, a lot of the traditional rituals, dances, things like that, you know, and, uh, you know, different events, you know, within those communities have been structured not to carry on the culture, but to promote tourism. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know. My question, I have a question in the fact that they want to make money. Why can't they hire some of their artisans to make strictly for uh, their individual art for tourism and not necessarily for Use you use, use of their ceremonial uh, things, and they mm. could make money from. Honestly, it wouldn't have made in China. It would be an original piece. Mm -hmm. Bye. Now, now, now you now you now you know from 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 from, from what the last film showed. That is what they do. What they do, they 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 have two different rituals. They have a ritual for the tourists. And they have a real ritual for for uh, for themselves. Yeah, there's there's the things that go on within the culture. Yeah, mm -hmm. and they're not <clears throat> and they're not the same thing. A lot no, of because they, they would have the same beauty in it because of their. You're an artist. You have you can copy somebody else's or you can do your own. Mm -hmm. They can do their own, but not use it for the ceremonial. But it would still have the original beauty mm -hmm. of their art style. Yeah. Well, and in Native American cultures, uh, you know, and particularly, you know, certain Native nations, um, you know, they prohibited uh, a lot of the import 
of like mass manufactured things, uh, like for example, the Navajo, uh, the Hopi, you know, I know the Ute Nation, things like that. Um, you know, they, on the edge of the reservation, they used to have like a lot of little gift shops and stuff like that. And that's where you'd find the tourist trade stuff. Um, you know, they've, well, even the Cherokee Nation uh, has, has pretty much so put a ban on all of that. And now, you know, the local people actually have to make the stuff, you know, if they're going to sell it as being representative of their culture. Now, the difference is, and this came up in the, the film as well, uh, just like in Africa, you know, those cultures have evolved, right? Yeah. You know, they're not doing the same thing that they did. And so like in those ceremonial dances, they have new masks, they have new characters, you know? Yeah. They're telling a different story, you know? They're actually, you know, they're actually updating their culture to be within the situation that they're living in now. Um, you know, so they actually had a mask for the, for the anthropologist, <laughs> you know, which I thought was pretty funny, um, you know, that they actually like, okay, so yeah, it's like, yeah, this, this, this is a character in our life now, so. Well, but the so-called tourists, if they want the old type of art, they could recreate with less uh, symbolism, perhaps like an older piece because you're hunting for something special something that uh, old that that will that is not maintained anymore because you lose it completely yeah that, well, that's what i'm saying you know what is really interesting about man we say we love all of these kind of things and we cherish them all and then we have wars that destroy them all we try to uh, annihilate uh everybody everyone else's culture Every, every every different country around them, you just name them. I don't have to say that. That yeah. they try to destroy the culture of those com of those countries, and and like and try to kill the people like they didn't exist. And then you try to put it back together after you made friends again. I mean, that happens all over the world since since man began. You know, so it's something about us, <laughs> the love and the hate as human yeah. beings and what we do. So and art always. Help Thank God, some of it stays around that you can tell that people used to live here. You know, I don't know what happened to them, but they lived here. Uh, they were killed off, phantom or disease or something, but you know, it has, it has a story itself. Two, two, two styles of art from the uh, from the ancient days and from the newer the newer uh, section would be your continual uh, growth yeah. of the new. Well, thing. and yeah, one of the things yeah. I wanted to bring up also was uh, in that video, okay, uh, they showed the uh, city of Jenna. And Jenna goes back, I mean, what, 4,000 years, 5,000 years? And you saw that Islamic temple, that mud brick structure. Oh, the mud the one that we build every year? Yeah, yeah. Well, they, yeah, they, they repair it and stuff every year. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, okay. you know, um, what, it, what was it, three <laughs> years ago? You know, three years ago, that was attacked by another Islamic group who actually blew that structure up and destroyed it. You know, and, uh, and you know, so Claudia's point is, yeah, there's always conflicts, there's wars, there's, you know, within any culture, you know, or group of cultures, there's conflicts. Uh, and we do, we, we lose, you know, a lot of the historical context of, you know, architecture and art and things that have been produced, you know, and been there for literally thousands and thousands of years. Yeah. That's in uh, uh, Ethiopia, huh? That no, it was in Mali. Mali? Oh, yeah, I saw that on, uh, on Publix TV when they were, everybody go get together, the whole town, and they fix the temple and all that stuff, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we watched that. It was a, a film, uh, you know, on perspective. Well, produced by this, you know, under perspective, which is, you know, this group of art films. Um, anyway, we're going to move on, okay? Because I want to show you some other things here, okay? Still dealing with African art. 
but uh, where do I want to go? I want to go here, right? Characteristics of, oh, okay. No, no, I want to go to this one first. Again, this is a little more about historical context. Um, and then we're going to look at, uh, you know, a couple of contemporary African artists and things like that. So let me start this all the way at the beginning. Some anthropologists have suggested that the defining quality setting human beings apart from our evolutional ancestors is not physical, but creative. For the purpose of this lesson, we'll talk about art as an act of deliberate creation expression, not just formal paintings and sculpture, would like to expect, would expect to find in an art gallery. Ancient people had far less access to resources that most of us enjoy in the modern world, and a great deal of their time was devoted to daily survival. Under such conditions, human creativity would rarely be about purely personal expression or basic beautification. Even personal ornaments probably had a spiritual or social function, such as the Ghanaian kente cloth today with patterns that send a social message and communicate status. Weapons and tools also often had a creative embellishment and thus ancient art was often both expressive and functional or having a practical use. The focus of this lesson will be Sub-Saharan Africa since geographically isolated Egypt from the main continent and plugged its history into what we call now Western tradition. Let's first focus on some of the great qualities of Sub-Saharan traditional African art, including that ancient African visual art tends to be figurative, emphasizing the human form in three dimensions, even if that form embodies divine or spiritual beings and functional. African creative culture is highly performative, being rich in dance and music, both are central to worship, festivals, and social expression. Obviously, we have little record of these activities prior to the modern times. African narrative tradition is oral. In West Africa, a professional class of storytellers or historians emerged called griots. Their orations, too, were probably accompanied by music in ancient times. The design and layout of African art frequently reveal a concept called fragile geometry. Okay, let's now define the artistic term medium. The genre before talking about some specific types used in ancient Africa. In art lingo, medium refers to the material or form of which generally comes the stuff which is made of watercolor, oil, pastels, rock, marble, ivory, fabric, digital photography, clay, are all types of media. Genre. Genre indicates the category or classification of the art. Painting, sculpture, dance, Architecture, drama, jazz are all genres. Owing to resource availability and other socioeconomic factors, much traditional African art has been created with non-durable perishable media such as wood and other plant fiber. We'll look at some of the exceptions, but to a large extent, we have to speculate about the ancient art through the references to more contemporary the oldest surviving examples of human creativity were done on rock or rock shaped from it. In engravings on okra also used as a pigment of the body from the Blombos cave in South Africa. They've been dated from 70,000 to 100,000 years ago, making them the oldest examples of ancient African art yet discovered. Their abstract paintings indicate higher order thinking. Blombos also yielded crafted shell beads, bone tools, and other examples of human craft and creativity. A fancy word for rock cravings is petrol. Beads. Charles, is this on fast speed? No. Because it seems like it's going very fast. Look at them spread no, it's Algeria, just her. Chad, oh. Namibia, Niger, Tanzania, South Africa, Zimbabwe, and Libya. In Badus, the Sahara, a life-sized pair of giraffes highlights the scope of the investment in this ancient art. In fact, giraffe petrol box were almost sub-genre of their own, being found off in numerous sites across thousands of years and in many different styles. In addition, last June in Somalia is one of the many sites that helped trace the development of African heading and livestock domestication by providing us with vibrant visual art in the form of cave paintings, metalwork, ceramics, and masks. Metalwork is more recent phenomenon in Africa 
largely because of resource distribution. But the famous bronzes of Benin, actually made of brass in some instances, challenged many European stereotypes when discovered is did the amazing sculptures of the Yoruba in bronze and even copper, a difficult medium to work with. Various sculptures and plaques date back over 3,500 years ago. The situation is more is similar with ceramics. African potters did not use the potter's wheel, so vessels are heavy but also fragile. Log ceramic sculptures made from terracotta stand out for their stunning imagination, design and uniqueness in combined medium and genre. Masks provide a wild, widespread and incredible diverse format for creativity and expression among African cultures. Because of their medium, however, frequently in wood base with a broad array of added material, we mainly have more recent examples of what is almost certainly an extremely ancient art form. Like so many African arts, the global art for the matter, masks were frequently caved for ceremonial and ritual purposes. In many cases, masks were believed to be infused with spiritual essence and some even dark and dangerous power. Such masks were generally kept hidden away when more in ritual use or sometimes even destroyed after a particular ritual was concluded. This power to channel spiritual forces or beings could also take a more positive and public form in the Dan culture. For example, marriage masks for brides and groom allow them to recreate a mythological first marriage and connect a present moment and a mythical ancient past in the ordinary with the supernatural. African masks are more often uniform though they depict animals as well, such as elephants or gazelles, depending on the region and culture. The caving styles varies from highly realistic to highly exaggerated and abstract. The dramatic angles and planes of West African masks, for instance, influence the wool works of Picasso. Benin masks can be eerily lifelike across in a variety of media. Dan masks elaborate upon the set styled characteristics according to creativity and prestige of the cover. Bow masks can be quite abstract and symbolic. One type, for example, called a goli, emerges the characteristics of the sun and the buffalo. Again, we can only speculate about ancient mask art, but the prominence of art masks in more recent times in Africa throughout the world as well as the enduring connection to the religious practice and fundamental social rituals makes it extremely likely that the mass tradition had, has sprung from ancient roots. As with much of this visual art, traditional African architecture was constructed from non-durable materials. A few examples exist outside of Egypt and Nubia, modern Sudan, but architecture and the artistic imagination behind it refers as to much of the layout of the built environment as a particular building or building style. In recent years, the work of uh, eco-mathematics has revealed an exciting component of African artistic design in the form of fractal geometry. Put simply, fractals refer to the reputation of a particular seed shape or diminishing increasing scale that can theoretically stretch into infinity. Dr. Ron Eglesh, in his work, African Fractals, has noted this phenomenon not only with the architectural layout, but in sculpture, textiles, patterns, religious symbols, and even, believe it or not, hairstyles. Fractal geometry in the arts seems to be a distinguishing feature in the African arts, differentiating it from Western styles while demonstrating a high conceptual sophistication. So as a lesson summary, let's review the main facts we've covered in this lesson. The creative sculptures of the Sub-Saharan Africa are heavily in performative and oral visual arts genres and categories tend to be figurative, emphasizing on the human form in three dimensions and function. Resource limitations resulted in the use of mainly bio, bio, biodegradable artistic material or mediums, ancient rocks or pavings or petroglyphs, however, which are found throughout Africa are durable 2D exceptions. African artists have also worked with metal and ceramics in a, on a limited basis. Examples, the use of bronze and copper dating back 3,000, 5,000 years ago and the stunning <laughs> um, knock sculpture in terracotta. Masks mostly came from wood, a distinctive and probably ancient African art form. They are strongly associated with the ritual and spiritual expressions and are both the physical art and traditional architectural design reviewed on the underlying factual patterns, a distinct trait that distinguishes it from its Western artistic practices. Thank you very much for joining my lesson today. She yeah. was going so fast, I couldn't even take notes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. She needed to take a breath.
you know. Actually, she just needed to breathe through. Searching for a new Kia? But, uh, you know, the fact is, she covered a lot of important and rather interesting things, if you, if you could get anything out of that. Uh, the main thing was that if, uh, you know, if, if you look at it on a time scale, you know, African art actually goes back, uh, you know, quite a long ways. You know, you've, you've got, you know, cave and rock paintings uh, in Africa that literally date back to 150,000 years, okay? So if you go back 150,000 years ago, you know, you're literally talking about a time when not only Homo sapiens were walking around, but actually now they're saying that there may have been as many as four different human, you know, subgroups or species walking around at the same time. Okay. And, uh, and that's an interesting story all in itself, but, you know, creating art is, or, you know, making images, has been something that's been part of human evolution, you know, and it, it dates back from our very, very early, you know, periods of time. Um, and so, you know, this is, you know, this is sort of ingrained in us as human beings. Uh, it's just part of us, you know, in making, you know, we make stuff. But along with that, you know, one of the reasons you don't have a lot of information on, you know, ancient African art is because they used, you know, biodegradable materials. You know, they didn't make things out of plastic that will be around for, you know, 2,000 years. Um, you know, they didn't. Yeah, they, they didn't. They won't be around? Pardon? I think they made from bronze wouldn't be around? Well, yeah, yeah. The, the exceptions were, you know, uh, the rock paintings and metal pieces, right. and then right. some of some of the ceramic pieces. You know, we mm -hmm. we have evidence of, but a lot of you know a lot of the stuff that they use, you know, day to day in those cultures, it's not there anymore. You know, it's you know if you make something out of wood, um, you know, wood is a pretty durable material, and it can be around for a long period of time, if it's in a protected environment. You know, if it's exposed to the elements, um, you know, it's not going to hang around very long. You know, it's, it's actually going to deteriorate over time. So, uh, you know, so we don't really have a lot of historical context. You know, we can't really put our hands on a lot of those things that were made, you know, because they have basically fallen apart, you know, over time, you know. So, um, so a lot of it is speculation. Um, and to, you know, with a lot of the contemporary and or, you know, let's say African art that goes back, you know, a couple of hundred years that we can actually put our hands on. And in most cases, it's wood carved mass, pottery pieces, things like that. Um, we have to make, you know, an assumption or speculation that those are not original you know, from 200 years ago that they go much further back, that they relate to much earlier cultures, you know, and that was, that was kind of her point, you know, so mm -hmm. anybody got any questions about that before we move on real quick? I thought it was very interesting that they made those beautiful pieces of pottery without mm -hmm. a pot potting wheel. Right. They didn't go into the details of that, but it must have been very difficult. Uh, well, that's, uh, Africa is, you know, uh, earlier on, I was talking to uh, Armando, who is going to be taking a, a clay class, and he doesn't want to do pottery, but I told him <laughs> I'm going to force him to make a pinch pot. <laughs> yeah. Well, pinch pottery started in Africa, and then after that, you know, they went from pinch to coil, and so, um, you know, they basically you know, really worked, you know, in those two styles of making pottery. And it wasn't really until uh, you got to the Middle East 
and really early like you know like persian babylonian assyrian cultures you know before they came up with the potter's wheel and started throwing pots you know on a wheel um which was kind of an innovative thing and you know helped things be a little more symmetrical but you know it's uh you know there's a cultural difference there you know in in how you do it but you know pottery has been around for a good 40 or 50,000 years that we know of mm -hmm. and you know those two methods were used really up until what about 6,000 years ago you know when when they came up with the potter's wheel and started you know started throwing pots on wheels so uh, Another, another thing that struck me that was so interesting was the term she used, frac fractual. Fractal. And the, 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 what? Yes. Fractal. Fractal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, looked, it looked, it reminded me of the, uh, the art of the Indians of the Southwest. Mm -hmm. The patterns were beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, you know, a fractal is any sort is an of repeating sort of pattern. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, and that's what that's what they make a big deal about in math. Mathematics exactly. is mm -hmm. a repetition of a pattern. Mm -hmm. Two, four, six, eight, three, six, nine, twelve. Right. And uh, that's all tied in together. It was so interesting. <laughs> well, we we could go down the whole fractal hole. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, you know, because I mean what they're what they're what they're finding out actually is that in nature you know uh, you know you've got all these repeating shapes and patterns um, yes. and we'll have to talk about that one day because that's that's bled over into computer science and one of the ways that they've actually improved information storage you know in computer science is through the use of fractals mm -hmm. so uh but we'll, we'll go down that road another day because that's literally you know maybe even you know weeks of conversation so um anyway we're gonna we're gonna look at uh two more videos real quick um one is a young lady talking again about uh african art but contemporary African art, you know, and how it relates to the traditional. And then we're actually going to uh, look at an interview uh, with a contemporary African artist that I think you'll really kind of enjoy. Let's see what time it is. Uh, we've got time for these. These are both short. Okay. So. I was very aware of the time constraints here. <laughs> oh, okay, dokie. Okay, so yeah, now she doesn't talk as fast. <laughs> Good. All right. <laughs> Do you know that some of the castle's work was inspired by African art? She breathes. Why me for Miss is laughing? <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Gabriella and you're welcome to the Sankofa Fanatica series. Today we're going to be looking at Africa's influence on modern art. Now what's African art? African art describes the modern historical paintings, sculptures, installations and other visual culture from continental Africans and the African continent. Now this may also include the art of African diasporas like African American, Caribbean, or art in South American societies inspired by African tradition. African art is so beautiful and unique. It employs various media, including pottery, rock art, textiles, masks, personal decoration, and jewelry. African art gets a lot of its influence in traditional African religion. In the past, many pieces of art were created for spiritual rather than creative purposes. 
A lot of African cultures emphasize the importance of ancestors as intermediary between the living God and the Supreme Creator. And art is sometimes seen as a way to connect these spirits with ancestors. Seeing that African art gets a lot of its influence from religion, the arrival of both Christianity and Islam have greatly influenced the art of the African continent. And the traditions of both have been integrated within the beliefs and the artwork of the continent. There's a lot of fascination with African art because of its unique features and designs that reflect the rich and diverse culture and history of different African tribes and places. Some of these unique features include stylized realism. When you look at different pieces of African art, you notice that they may resemble human figure or sometimes combine humans and animals. However, they are not depicted realistically or with stylized designs. For instance, Dolls may look like human beings with disproportionate body parts. Another beautiful feature of African art is dynamic form. Elongated necks, enlarged heads and arms, pointed breasts and the like are often found in human forms, which are frequently the subject of African art. These are examples of notable dynamic forms in this art, representing vitality, power and boldness of humanity. Attention to details and other excellent quality of African art. You will discover how African art exhibits fine craftsmanship with elaborate details done obviously with precision and skill. Indeed, these things are the ones that also contribute to the distinct quality of the artwork. Another key feature is geometric figure. There are plenty of African art pieces that show geometric themes, figures, and patterns. In a mask, for example, you can see a recurrence of ovals, circles and curves that work together to make the overall effect more striking and unified. Youthful appearance is probably one of the most outstanding qualities of African art. Part of African culture is the emphasis on health, vitality, physical strength and youthfulness. This is why a lot of human figures shown by art display youthfulness. This can be traced back to ancient times where many Africans lived off the land and had to rely on their strength to hunt, build, and perform other duties. Art was of incredible importance in pre-colonial Africa. One of the major significances was during religious rituals. Now, religious rituals were a key part in a lot of African cultures, and the use of sculptures featured prominently in religious rites. The masks and figures used in such rites were not worshipped, rather it was believed that the world was inhabited by many unseen spirits each with his own past and personality. These spirits involve themselves in the lives of human beings in many ways, for both good and evil. The figures or masks may the vehicle through which these spirits make themselves seen and their presence known in the world of men. The objects themselves, however, do not embody or contain the spirits, and even though they were respected and honored, they were not worshipped. Art was also used for authority and social control. Masks representing spirit forces were particularly important at ceremonies, marking the major changes in the lives of individuals or community events, such as initiations into adulthood or funeral ceremonies. At initiation ceremonies, the masks frequently led the boys into the bush schools where initiations took place. At funerals, the masks not only paid for their respect to the, to the deceased, but also guaranteed safe passage into the world beyond. Sculpture also served to symbolize authority and play important roles in maintaining social control. Figurative staffs were sometimes carried by representatives of chiefs and kings, symbolizing their power and authority. Often they spoke for him and represented him through visual proverbs as having the power, strength, and courage of such creatures as a leopard, water buffalo, or elephant. Sometimes it was deemed advisable to call upon the spirits settled disputes too intractable to be settled by normal temple authorities. In some cases, the spirits were thought to make themselves known through masks, and the decisions announced by the masks were accepted as having the weight of spiritual authority. Masks also maintained social control in more subtle ways. Often they served as teaching aids, augmenting the authority of the teacher himself, and by symbolizing the ideas or values he wished to teach. While masks were always treated seriously, the appearance itself might be accompanied by great merriment and humor was often built into their teaching roles. Thus, 
chiefs and elders might be criticized for pompousness or abuse of authority through seemingly comic ridicule and caricature by a mask. In similar vein, a mask might deliberately act in ways not normally tolerated in the society in order to teach by negative example. In this sense, even what might appear to be pure entertainment often had a more serious purpose. Art was also symbolic. Utilitarian objects such as wooden pulleys, bowls, stools, chairs, and textiles were also made with great care to beautify daily life, as well as to enhance the status of chiefs and prominent persons. In each case, the particular culture created its own set of symbols and artistic style, which were understood in the community. Those symbols varied widely between one community and the next. There was generally a given community a considerable degree of consistency and thus developed a large number of reasonably discrete styles. Though artists did not follow stylistic guidelines blindly and each added his or her own creativity and individuality to the objects they made, the artists generally worked with, within defined parameters of acceptability within the culture. With all of these, artists were thereby able to reinforce the traditional beliefs and values of men's society and political leaders who were their patrons. Perhaps because African masks were carved to be worn in performance and most figurative sculptures were also designed for ritual use, African art was principally symbolic rather than representational. It was more concerned with visualizing concepts rather than actually accurately representing nature. Unfortunately, a lot of these art pieces that connect to our history and culture isn't even on the continent anymore. Europeans, after imposing foreign rule over most of Africa, took much of its history and art with them, which today are displayed in foreign museums all around the globe. These museums offer the best glimpse into Africa's times before the arrival of colonialists. For example, the Sainsbury African Galleries in the British Museum in London display 600 objects in the largest permanent collection of African arts and culture in the world. The three permanent galleries provide a substantial exhibition space for the museum's African collection, comprising over 200,000 objects. This curatorial scope encompasses both archaeological and contemporary objects, including both unique masterpieces from artistry and objects of everyday life. A great addition was material amassed by Sir Henry Walcombe which was donated by the Wellcome History Medical Museum in 1954. Highlights of the African collection include the Benin and Iboku bronze sculptures, the beautiful bronze head of Queen Idia, a dozen exquisite afro portuguese ivories, a Dante gold work from Ghana, a white African drum also from Ghana, a series of soapstone figures from the Kissi people in Sierra Leone and Liberia, the toilet collection of central African sculptures, textiles, weaponry, important material from Ethiopia, the unique Lozira head from Uganda, excavated objects from Great Zimbabwe, a red dividing bowl from the Zenda people, and cave paintings and petroglyphs from South Africa. Now let's talk about the Benin bronzes. Before I go on, I'd like to make a distinction between Benin and Benin. Now Benin is a country in West Africa, while Benin is a town in Nigeria, in Edo State, Nigeria. So now these bronzes were seized by a British force in the Benin expedition of 1897 and given to the British Foreign Office. Around 200 of the bronzes were passed on to the British Museum, while the remainder was divided among the variety of collections, with the majority being purchased by Felix von Lushkan on behalf of the Konglicious Museum for Volkkunde, which means Royal Museum of Ethnology in Berlin. In 1936, Oba Kenzo II of Benin in Nigeria began the movement to return the corpus of objects now known in modern discourse as the Benin Bronzes. It's no surprise that various artists have drawn inspiration from African art. From its beauty to its uniqueness to its elaborate details, African art is truly captivating. Now, during the early 1900s, the aesthetics of traditional African sculpture became a powerful influence among European artists who formed an avant-garde in the development of modern art. In France, Henri Matisse, Pablo Picasso, and the School of Paris friends 
blended the highly stylized treatment of a human figure in African sculptures with painting styles derived <laughs> from post-impressionist work. The resulting pictorial flatness, vivid color palette, a fragmented cubist shape helped to define early modernism. While these artists knew nothing of the original meaning and function of the West and Central African sculptures they encountered, they instantly recognized the spiritual aspect of the composition and adapted these qualities to their own efforts to move into the naturality that had defined Western art since the Renaissance. The classic African period lasted from 1907 to 1909. African art has made a lot of contributions to modern art with its use of vibrant colors and very distinct qualities. African art is truly unique. I hope you found this interesting and informative. Please give us a thumbs up, share this video with your contact, and subscribe to us. Okay. Due to a uh, tight time schedule, because we want Armando to be able to go to lunch. Oh, yes. We're going to jump right into the next short, and this is a very short video. It's only about what, three minutes? Yeah, something like that. Four minutes. Um, but well, it will introduce <laughs> you to kind of a wide array of Different contemporary African. In our artists. previous video, we discussed contemporary African painting, encompassing the top 10 of the most influential artists. Today, we are pleased to present you a more extensive selection of artists and artworks. Welcome to African Painting Today, a visual anthology. Interesting. Pardon? I like the one before. Thank you. 
Hmm. Okay. Hey guys, check this out. No, we don't want to buy a generic. <laughs> okay. So, um, you know, I know that was like real quick, you know, but what did you see there? Anybody have any observations about any of that stuff? Very detailed. Some of it looked like lace. Some mm -hmm. of the patterns looked like lace, like it was woven. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, it seems like there's a transition going on in, in, in Africa, just like we had our transition, they're having a transition. A lot of it is art in the paint we've seen now, we're seeing not so many sculptures as we are seeing uh, uh, actual paintings and sculptures, actual paintings, at least that's what we just saw. Uh, and it's the storytelling of what's going on in their society or what has past has happened. And some of it is more going to more, uh, more abstract. And when I uh, was watching a video one time, and it was these young people that were, well, they were in their 40s, 30s and 40s, and they would, uh, and it was a Britain kind of thing. And they had made a lot of different things. And it was a, one was a designer, a couple of them were designers. And all of their work was contemporary and, uh, or modern bent. And I was saying, okay, is this Africa today? Or is it gonna be any mixing of the two, the past and the, and the, and the, and the present? Uh, are they really doing it to make money or are they doing it for the love of the art? So it was kind of like, it's still a little bit uh, confusing to me of what the modern artists are doing. Uh, are they doing it to sell? Are they doing it uh, to make, tell a story of what's going on in society? Are they doing it to make a statement? And so, you know, so, and some of them have been to, these are not raw artists. These, not many of these people have already been to school. Some of the art we saw before the ancient art, they were kind of like handmade, homemade, um, self-taught and this kind of thing. So I'm still kind of like, um, I'm still scratching my head and wondering about today's art and what's, what's coming, coming from, from Africa. And I, because I, they, they have this sleek furniture, a sleek lifestyle, and, and stuff. And it's, it's a very modern. And, and I'm saying, if I went over there to live, I mean, what kind of furniture would I have? What kind of style would I want my home and this kind of thing? What do I think should Africa should be today? And where uh, and how that transition takes place? I know none of us lives in the kind of house of, of, that we lived in when we were very young. We have bathrooms and all that kind of stuff. But, uh, but everybody, it's, it's kind of like a transition that I don't, and I don't, I'm not as familiar with um, how Africa today go along with the transition from Africa from, from ancient time, now that they're free to do, to do individual kind of things and not collectively as a community. Okay, here, real quick, uh, somebody else had a comment, was it Bernice or anybody? Yeah, Eloise, but she's silent. <laughs> Eloise, did you have it something to say? It wasn't me, but I do have a comment on the. Huh? I have a comment about the first, the other film. Um, it's uh, surprising. Well, not surprising because I knew it already. That so much art was taken out of uh, Africa and different other countries too. I'm sure because the lady, I I could not understand everything she was saying, but she did mention over 200,000 pieces of art had been taken from there. And more, it seems to me that more uh, the cultural art is in other countries rather than where it belongs. So that, uh, and I think it should probably, it should be returned because I'm pretty sure the uh, ad, the explorers at that time did not intend maybe to be stealing the art, but they were taking advantage of the situation. So mm -hmm. it would be good if a lot of that art was returned since so much of it is gone. Okay. Agatha Christie, Agatha Christie wrote a story about that in, 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 in um, Ecuador where they went to Egypt and they were stealing and they were taking art for, for the British Museum and right. they killed one another to get that done, you know? Right. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna wrap the class up here, but I, I wanna leave you with a thought. 
Oh, thanks. Okay. And my thought is this, okay, and we'll, we'll talk more about this, uh, particularly like on Wednesday and maybe next Monday. But uh, in particular, the idea that I want to leave you with is the fact that there's not many places in the world that you can go today that there's not a McDonald's. Not as a what? There's not a, <laughs> there's not a McDonald's. Okay, now what does that mean? Okay, what that means is that as time has gone on, you've taken all these different cultures all around the world and they're all homogenizing. They're all, you know, it's basically becoming a, a world culture. It's not a Western culture. It's not an Eastern culture. It's not a South American culture, North American culture. We're, we're, you know, it hasn't gotten there yet, but we are well on our way to having a homogenous world culture. That's due to the advent of communication, particularly computer, mm -hmm. internet, things like that. But mm -hmm. also, you know, the frequency of travel and people immigrating, you know, from country to country, you know, uh, you know, it's often said that one of the strengths of, you know, the United States is the fact that we have such a diverse, you know, immigrant population. You know, we've had waves of different people and different cultures come here and their culture, you know, uh, gets absorbed into American culture. So American culture is not a pure thing. It's a homogeny of a lot of different influences you know but that's also happening in europe and in asia and uh, so i just want to leave you with that thought you know that as time goes on those vast cultural differences that used to divide different parts of the world are rather quickly disappearing okay you know so that's really all I have for today. Um, if you have any thoughts about that, um, you know, I'd, I'd like you to share them. Um, we're, going, we're going to look at at least seven or eight different artists from Africa on Wednesday and look at their individual work. And these are all contemporary artists. Um, and some of them work in, in like uh, fiber and textiles, others are painters. Some of them are sculptors or sculptors or designers. Um, and so we're, we're gonna try to hit kind of a broad, you know, array of different art forms, okay? Anyhow. Uh -uh. Let, let, me, let me say one thing before we go. And this is way off the subject, I do know that. Uh-oh. But <laughs> but you know, I think about uh, when I was a little girl, my mother made quilts for us to keep warm in, in the winter time. Mm -hmm. And what she would do is at the end of the school year, whatever clothing that we couldn't wear, clothing that my father couldn't wear, so it was a lot of different uh, textures. It might, might have been a piece of an overall, might have been a piece of uh, uh, Sunday dress, might have been a piece of school dress. But anyway, and, and, this, and this quilt was like a memory. You know, it, you know, oh, I wore that when I was six. Oh, my father had me pants when I was eight, you know. And, and so, so, when, so when I see quilts now that, you know, you buy these new pieces and you cut them all the same way. And it, it's, you know, it's, it's like, a, um, it's like, a, um, what's, what's the word? It's like, it's like you, you change what a quilt actually meant, you know. Like, like a quilt was a history of the family, you know. Right. Yes, it's mm -hmm. called, yeah, it goes back to that question of cultural appropriation. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And we can, we can spend a long time talking about that. <laughs> yeah. so, so, I, so I wasn't too far off the subject, huh? I'm sorry, what? So I was not too far off the subject, huh? No. No. Uh, no. In no. fact, that's kind of what we've been talking about all day, you know, right. uh, the underlying theme. You know, and and we'll get more into a cult, cultural appropriation and 
possibly the good side, the bad side of that, and, side, and kind yes. of where it's going. Whether whether <laughs> about and, 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 and I I didn't have enough sense to appreciate that uh, that I that when I left home I should have taken some of those pills with me. Mm -hmm. Because now the skeleton wins, you know, and I don't, I only know one person who I may can get one from. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, those are, those are family treasures now. And if, if, if you can find them, you know, and if you, if you <laughs> have them in your family, it's okay. definitely something you want to hang on to. So. Uh, Charles, the, yeah. one of the, one of the centers when we were at the, the evening of the festival, evening mm -hmm. of the arts, and yeah. we went to, went, went to the various centers. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, I don't know which one, was it was Darnell, one of them had all of these beautiful uh, quilts and and yeah. and then I went into the class and I could see the quilt makers all of them working together there. Mm -hmm. So I'm quite sure that they had some kind of relationship with their families in right. putting those quilts all together. It was just amazing. Yeah, yeah, actually Darnell has a very strong, you know, that's one of the strong uh, aspects of their yes. art program. Is, yes. is you know they have a very strong quilting group over there and yes, i think yes. um uh, didn't bowden as well yeah yeah yeah, I, did, yeah I think and benson did for a while we had a mm -hmm. small group of uh, ladies who would get together and quilt there as well um it kind of went away at benson but i i think uh yeah because when heather was there she oh. You know, she worked with some of the quilters as well. But uh, yeah, that's that's a whole other conversation that we will get into. <laughs> I okay. promise. Yeah, okay. because yeah, that that kind of you know it goes back to heritage and roots and where people come from and the influences of different cultures. You know, and and some that are uniquely American uh, as well. So. Anyway, I, I thank you all for coming. I hope you got a little something out of this today. Uh, okay. And, you know, uh, you know, if you have things to add, uh, like I said, we'll look at about seven or eight different artists on Wednesday. Uh, but if you have comments and things that you want to talk about in regards to what we saw today, you know, we can carry that conversation on on Wednesday as well. Okay? Okay. Thank all you, right. Charles. Anyway, thank you all for coming. Thank Enjoy you. your lunch. Thank you, Charles. I think Armando's already escaped. So yeah. he's, he's well on his way to the Benson lunchroom already. So anyway. Hey, bye, my fellow college students. Yep. Bye-bye, <laughs> everybody. Bye. Uh,